On June 18, 1941, A. Philip Randolph and Franklin D. Roosevelt met in a historic meeting about civil rights, one that would result in a compromise known as Executive Order 8802. Although FDR did several things to help African Americans, such as creating the Black Cabinet and reversing Woodrow Wilson's policy of excluding African Americans from federal jobs, he was by no means a civil rights activist. The little things that he did were due to pressure from his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, and black protest. A. Philip Randolph was the main proponent for creating Executive Order 8802. In 1925, he was chosen by the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters to lead their organization, a labor union aimed at improving the working conditions for porters. The Brotherhood was the first African-American labor union to sign a collective bargaining agreement with a major U.S. corporation, a testament to Randolph's ability to negotiate and resolve conflict. Through the negotiation process, Randolph gained many allies and forged connections that would help him to organize the March on Washington movement in 1941. The March on Washington movement was created with the goal of protesting segregation of the armed forces. With World War II roaring overseas, African Americans felt discontent that color was a factor when defending their nation. They were channeled into segregated army units where white officers made them work as laborers. Few black units were allowed to step foot on the war front, depriving them of the chance to prove their loyalty. As the organizer, Randolph used his influence to distribute a pamphlet titled Call to Negro America to March on Washington for Jobs and Equal Participation in National Defense on July 1, 1941. His original goal was for 10,000 protesters. However, by June of 1941, their campaign was 100,000 strong. Instead of confronting FDR directly, Randolph first turned to a trusted friend, Eleanor Roosevelt. I have talked over your letter with the president, and I feel very strongly that your group is making a very grave mistake at the present time to allow this march to take place. I am afraid it will set back the progress which is being made, in the army at least, towards better opportunities and less segregation. I feel that if any incident occurs as a result of this, it may engender so much bitterness that it will create in Congress even more solid opposition from certain groups than we have in the past. Eleanor Roosevelt to A. Philip Randolph, June 10, 1941. The United States was still recovering from the Great Depression with support from FDR's progressive New Deal policies. To successfully pass new legislation, FDR required the support of Congress. Unfortunately, the Southern Democrats, who Eleanor was referring to, were pro-segregation and blocked any attempts at promoting civil rights. Unlike FDR, Eleanor was not bound by such limitations and openly discussed civil rights, perhaps even too radically so. Eleanor supported the beliefs of all people, which to the surprise of many, did not exclude communism. In 1939, Eleanor accepted that the American Youth Congress had communist members, claiming, to limit the rights of any one group was to endanger the rights of all. This was largely controversial at the time, especially with the creation of the House Un-American Activities Committee. This federal organization was formed in 1939 to identify suspected communists and summon them to court for questioning. The very existence of the HUAC caused Americans to believe communists had invaded into their everyday lives, threatening their way of living. Unlike other first ladies, Eleanor stood independently from FDR. Even before FDR became president, Eleanor was a prominent radio host and journalist, acquiring a substantial fan base. She later wrote a newspaper column titled My Day, which had over 4 million viewers. Using these mediums, Eleanor discussed issues that others in government were afraid to bring up, such as equal rights and controversial federal policies. Through her work as a civil rights activist, she made many close friends with African American leaders such as Walter White of the NAACP and A. Philip Randolph. It was these connections that gave activists access to FDR directly, something that would have otherwise been a difficult task. Since FDR was still worried about losing the support of Southern Democrats, which would prevent him from effectively dealing with World War II and alleviating symptoms of the Great Depression, he first tried to convince Randolph that the march would be impossible to control.
Uh, the president uh, made uh, as his first comment. He said, uh, Phil Randolph, we can't have 100,000 Negroes marching on Washington. If anything such as that were to occur, you wouldn't be able to, to manage them. We might have bloodshed and death. In reality, Roosevelt's primary fear was the tarnishment of America's international reputation as a leader in liberty. Roosevelt had openly reprimanded Germany for its racist policies against Jews and advocated for liberty and freedom. In his fireside chat titled, On the Arsenal of Democracy, FDR states, They may talk of a new order in the world, but what they have in mind is only a revival of the oldest and the worst tyranny. In that, there is no liberty, no religion, no hope. The proposed new order is the very opposite of a United States of Europe or a United States of Asia. It is not a government based upon the consent of the governed. And Roosevelt could not take their chance that 25,000 people would be in Washington at a time when he was calling the United States the arsenal of democracy. And then if 25,000 Negroes came to Washington, um, he would look like a fool. Of course, Randolph refused to concede without winning any concessions. After much negotiation, the two parties compromised with the issuing of Executive Order 8802, which banned discrimination in the defense industry and created the Fair Employment Practices Commission to enforce the new policy. Although Randolph was satisfied, many of his followers believed that he settled for too little at a time when FDR was completely pushed into a corner. People were upset because it meant you had to rely on Roosevelt's word, and Roosevelt did not have that much credibility among African Americans about anything. Uh, he had not demonstrated any great commitment to civil rights. He had not demonstrated any commitment at all to equal employment opportunities, certainly. And a piece of paper with Roosevelt's name on it didn't mean a whole lot to a lot of black people. His decision to back down was likely out of respect for Franklin and Eleanor, recognizing that they were limited by their positions as well. An executive order was not a permanent solution, and if minorities wanted civil rights legislation to pass in the future, they needed the support of the executive branch. The most immediate problem coming out of the Great Depression was jobs, and Randolph recognized that. Jobs were still relatively scarce outside the defense industry, and by banning discrimination in these factories, tens of thousands of jobs were made available to blacks, greatly improving their standard of living. However, the compromise was still far from ideal. Although many companies chose to comply with the order, the Federal Employment Practices Commission had little power against those that resisted. When discrimination was found, the commission could not send violators to jail, nor could it cancel contracts. Even so, as the first federal action to promote equal opportunity, Executive Order 8802 made massive strides for civil rights and showed labor unions that they could make a difference. In order to quell unrest among those who were unsatisfied over the compromise, Randolph kept the March on Washington movement alive, renaming it the March on Washington Committee. Although FDR had demanded the cancellation of a March on Washington, blacks could still protest elsewhere. Throughout the early 1940s, mass protest rallies popped up in major cities around the nation. 10,000 showed up in Detroit, 16,000 in Chicago, and a staggering 25,000 crammed into New York City's Madison Square Garden. After eight more years of constant conflict between minorities and the government, President Harry S. Truman chose to ignore threats of a Southern Democrat filibuster and issued Executive Order 9981 on July 26, 1948, finally banning discrimination in the armed forces. Even though FDR failed to fully support civil rights, his actions were understandable for his time. His presidency ran through crisis after crisis, never giving him the opportunity to champion a specific cause. To successfully drag the nation through troubled times, he was forced to issue broad policies that would offend the least people in Congress. Executive Order 8802 did just that while still greatly helping African Americans and paving the way for future presidents, such as Truman, to follow in his example.